yet without sin. So the first part of that mystery is God was manifest or revealed in the flesh. But that's not all he says. Look at verse 16. Justified in the Spirit. Now what does he mean when he says justified? Vindicated. It means that, you know what? That the Spirit did what? It witnessed of who he was. Is that not right? So he was justified in the Spirit. And then it says, seen by who? Now how do we know that he was seen by angels? Because, well, because the Bible says so. But in every account, how many accounts do we have where he is, where the angels even come minister to him? Remember that the temptation in Matthew chapter 4? Angels came and ministered to him. The angels saw who he was and what he was doing. And then he goes on to say, this mystery <coughs> preached unto the Gentiles. Now, why would that be a mystery? Because they were not Jews. Because who are the chosen people? The Jews. The Jews. Where did we get all of our Bible from? The Jews. That's exactly right. So when he writes to the Jews and says, guess what? It's a mystery because God is going to do what? See, for a long time, they thought that God was only going to save them. When in reality, God's plan of salvation was going to be for who? Amen. Whosoever. Amen. Didn't matter what your background, didn't matter what your culture, God was going to save everybody. He said, it's a mystery that he was preached unto the Gentiles. Believed on in the world, and then finally received up into glory. Now, you have to think about this in each individual case. Because what he's doing is making a legal argument for the salvation of mankind. Because here's the deal. You have to remember that in their time period, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the body. Matter of fact, actually, there was a time that they actually fought one another, and Paul kind of put them on one another between the Pharisees and the Sadducees because he said Christ was, was, was risen from the dead. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead, and the Sadducees didn't, and they got in a big argument about it. Then they forgot all about Paul, and they went to argue amongst themselves. So it's necessary that we understand each part of that mystery is vitally essential to our salvation. Amen. And if any part of that is missing, <clears throat> guess what? <clears throat> Jesus wasn't who he claimed to be. So he said, the deacon must understand what? The mystery of the faith. And hold it in a pure conscience. Now, what do you think he means when he says that? Anybody? What does he mean when he says he needs to be able to hold that mystery of faith in a good conscience. It means that he's truly been converted. And I'll go you one step further than that. Has the ability to be able to share those facts with other people. Now, here's the deal. I, just, I, I can't remember if it was Peter or Paul. One of them said, we can only testify to the things that we've seen. Now think about this for just a minute. You can't tell somebody else how to get saved if you're not saved. Amen. And the reason being is because if you don't understand it, how in the world can you explain it to somebody else? It's wonderful to watch uh, uh, our politicians and our elected officials get up there and become subject matter experts on something they can't even spell. But because some, some you know, uh, uh, college graduate, a kid, has told them that this is what they, they begin to spout these facts, when in reality, they don't really understand what's even going on. Now, I don't know about you, but you talking about something get confusing, start talking to somebody about a subject that they don't know nothing about. You will get all kinds of responses, and if you don't believe that, flip on your idiot box in the morning, to any news station that you would like and listen to them talk about anything that has to do with morality. And you will say, where did you get that from? Well, the problem is they're reasoning it within their own heart. That's why, you know, when uh, y'all remember Peter Jennings? He used to have that uh, program on called Finding the Historic Jesus. 
Y'all, anybody here remember that? Nobody here remembers that. Okay? Here's the deal. When you watch that, you know what you find out? He never did find Jesus. And you know why? Because he wasn't looking for the same Jesus you and I were looking for. He was looking for a man who had married Mary Magdalene and had some children and went off somewhere and died and nobody knows about it. And you know why he didn't find him? Because that person doesn't exist. Only the Son of God existed. Amen? And that's the mystery. So, he says now, he needs to be able to hold this in a good conscience. And, and I, I preached a whole sermon about this, about conscience not being the Holy Spirit. Okay? Don't think for a minute now, well, my conscience is at me and I feel guilty and that's the Holy Spirit. No, it's not. Okay? Holy Spirit and your conscience are two different things. Because here's the deal. Your conscience can be seared with a hot iron. You can get to a point where you are so hard-hearted that guess what? Nothing affects you. Listen to this. This is in 2 Corinthians 1 and 12. For our rejoicing is this, that the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with flesh and wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in this world and more abundantly to you word. In other words, what he said was, our conscience is clear. In other words, we've done everything the way we should have done it. And there is no guilt. You see, the conscience brings guilt. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. And there's something entirely different. Because I've known some people who were sorry that they got caught. And I know some people who were sorry for what they did. And there are two different, completely situations all the way around. Because here's the deal. Until a person is sorry for what they did, is there really any true way for them to come back or, I don't know what you would call that, uh, conversion or rehabilitation or, or somehow or another that program is going to help them? Is it? We got people in all kinds of, there's a program on every corner down in Augusta. Do they have a 100% uh, success rate? No, they don't. Most of them don't even have an 80%. Most of them are more like 20 or 30 percent. You know why that is? Because the program ain't no good. No. Because the people that are going into the program are what? They're not at the point where they, where they want to do any better. And until they want to do better, they may be sad they got caught. They may say, gee, you know, the court said I got to do this. But until they're ready, guess what happens? They just feel guilt. But they don't feel a repentance, a desire to do different. Does that make any sense? Really confusing. You get a lot of wine stairs out there. Scared me. All right. Now, look at verse ten. He says, "And let these also first be what proved." In other words, we've told over in another place. Lay hands uh, on no man suddenly. In other words, guess what a deacon has to be able to do? He needs to be. Proven. Why? Can somebody be proven in six weeks? Some folks can't be proven in six years. But here at Bethesda, in our Constitution, it's set up in such a way where a person has to be coming to church here for a year. Now, now, why do you think that that will be important? In a year, are you going to kind of see what they're made out of? In a year, are you going to be able to kind of see them in the way they respond in different situations? In a year, do you think that you can kind of, through prayer and, and supplication, God, can you kind of say, gee, guess what? Maybe this person may not make such a great deacon. Nod your head. And so he said, be careful. And here's the reason why. Because it's easy, it's like a preacher, it's easy to get a deacon. Not so easy to what? Not have a deacon. Alright? So he said, they need to be proven. You need to look at the way they live. You need to look at the way they treat their family. You need to look at the way they do business. You need to know everything about them as much as is humanly possible. In other words, to be proven. Verse 6 says, not a novice. You remember what we talked about a novice was what? 
somebody who was new to the faith, and, the, and talking about the pastor. And the reason for that was what? That if he were new to the faith, what was the danger? That he would be overtaken with what? Pride. Right? And then he would what? You'd be setting him up for failure. Is that not right? So the idea is, he said, this person needs to be proven. It says, goes on to say, and let them use the office of a deacon being found what? Now, once again, same thing that we said about the pastor. Is that not right? Let him be found blameless. Okay? Now, this is verse 11. Everybody was ready for me about the, uh, about the preacher being the husband of one wife. And we'll see how I was going to explain that. What about this one? Brother Sam ain't here. He's home sick, bless his heart. He said, oh, man, I was just sitting there. He said, I had built a fire back there waiting on you to get into that verse. How about now that we're talking about who? Wives. We're talking about the wives. Is that not right? And I go you one step further, folks. He's not just talking about deacons' wives. He's talking about all the ladies in the church. But, excuse me. Now you say, why would he be talking about all the ladies in the church? This says the deacons' wife. Well, the reason that he's talking to the ladies in the church is, guess what? The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Is exactly right. So, ladies, when before you get ready to say, well, we got to talk about these deacons' wives, you might want to look at this qualification as far as you go in your homes. It says, even so, must their wives be what? Grave, not slanders, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacon, or I'm, yeah, let me stop right here, okay? So what's the very first thing she must be? Reverend. Reverend, okay. Down okay. All right. Uh, she has to be grave or reverent. Then what does she have to not be? Not a slanderer. Woo! You ever been slandered? If you ain't, you just keep going to church. <laughs> Somebody will catch you. Blindside you. Y'all Georgia fans will understand that after the walk. <laughs> just blindside you. Right? What does he mean when he says not a slander? No, no gossip. No gossip. Yeah. Was it, isn't that funny? It was a man that came up with that. <laughs> I'm just saying. Look at this. 2 Thessalonians 3 and 11. He says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you how? Disorderly. Disorderly. Working not at all, but are now let me ask you a question. How does the Bible say you get to be a busybody? Y'all remember the little little cutout thing of Leroy Coffee? Where the woman came to the preacher and said, uh, you know, she, there was this, that was that, there was this going on in the church. And the pastor said, look, before you leave, I want you to do one thing for me. I want you to take a cup of water and I want you to walk around the sanctuary three times. Lay said, sure, I can do that. That's not a big deal. She came back to him and he said, let me ask you a question. He said, when you were walking around the sanctuary with that water and all them people there, did you see any hypocrites? Well, no, I was concentrating on the water. He said, well, did you see any backbiting going on? Well, no, I was concentrating on the water. Well, did you see any gossiping going on? Well, no, I was concentrating on the water. See, you become a busybody when you have the time to become a busybody. That's what I'm telling you now. You become a busybody. You become a Gladys Kravitz to get into everybody else's business except your own when you got too much time in your hands. Because let me tell you something. If you're working for the Lord, for the secular, for your family, whatever, when you're working, guess what? And you ain't got time for that junk. It's exactly right. But the minute you sit down, guess what begins to happen? Woo! 
Now my wife. My wife told me the other day, and we've lived in our house for 20-something years. Yeah, 30-something years. Long time. And she said, do you know that the floor in the back bathroom squeaks when you walk on <laughs> Now, folks, some days on there's a lot of things in my house that need to be done. But a floor that squeaked for the last hundred years is probably going to squeak for another hundred years. But because when my wife is in there without Sparky, because if she's got Sparky, she ain't got time to put no attention on nothing else, guess what she's going to do? She's going to tell me, the other day, we were in there getting dressed, we were getting ready to go somewhere. And she's just doing it. She's always ahead of me. Gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning, changes 14 times before it's time to leave at night. Right? And change about five times. This don't look good. Oh, I don't like the way this looks. Anyway. But we're standing there, and she says, she looks at the walls and says, you know, the walls in this bedroom need to be painted. I said, I like the color of the walls in the bedroom because I don't like the paint. But see, the thing that I'm trying to tell you is if you get enough time on your hands, guess what you can do? You can find fault with something. Say amen. Nod your head. Right? Something you ain't never even thought about before will just fly into your head and have to get done before the sun sets. Or... Guess what? If you can't figure out something at your house that needs to be done, guess what you'll do? You'll talk about somebody else's house and what needs to be done over there. Say amen. In other words, you begin to get into other people's business, and Jesus put it very simply, don't worry about the splinter in your husband's eye. <laughs> if what? If you've got a telephone pole... In yours. In other words, we got to put it this way. I'm going to give you the bone building and national version. Sometimes we ought to sweep around our own front doorstep before we worry about what somebody else is doing in the church. Now, I'm going to tell you something. And I'm going to point something out to you that you may have never thought about. But let me tell you something. Do you know that the people that complain about the teachers at the Bethesda Baptist Church are not teachers? Never have been, and for the most part, unless God changes their heart, never will be. Amen. But they'll complain about the teacher. And you say, you know, that's right. You're right, brother. So-and-so, he just ain't. Well, how about you teach? <laughs> I'm not a teacher. Amen? I just don't like the way they're doing that nursery back there, that Miss Peggy, I don't know, just dominates the place. Right? How about you help out? <laughs> no, me, I can't help out in the dirt. Who, me? <laughs> Amen? Yeah. I don't like the way the grass is being cut out. So I'm going to tell you what, Rip, let's talk to your husband. I don't like, man, you don't realize who's down here at 6 o'clock last night? Man, <laughs> that man was out here working in the dark. I thought, man, that's more dedication than I got. <laughs> I don't like the way this is being done. Well, how about you step in the oh, Kentucky, not me? <laughs> See, and you know why that is? Because you got too much time on your hands. If you were doing for the kingdom of God, if you were doing what you should be doing, guess what would happen? You wouldn't have time to worry about what everybody else is doing. You know why? Because I'm charging so hard. When I was in the secular world, I had a guy come talk to me about what was going on in another department. He was talking about another manager. And my response to him was simply this. If I could straighten out the problems in my own department, I would worry about what's going on in your department. But the problem is I can't straighten out the problems that are in my department. So here's the deal. Before you get ready to complain about what somebody else is doing, ask yourself this. 
would you be willing to do what they're doing? And if the answer to that is no, then I would encourage you to keep your mouth shut. I hope that wasn't too strong. That's not what it is. First Timothy 5 and 13 says, and with all, and, and with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and Busybodies speaking things which what? Now, if you happen to be in a conversation with somebody from Bethesda Baptist Church, notice I did not say a church member, okay? If you happen to be in a conversation and that conversation begins, I shouldn't say this, but... You need to stop it right there at those three letters. Because if you shouldn't be saying it, and the Holy Spirit is telling you, don't say it, you ought to keep your mouth shut. Okay? That's going to hurt some feelings. I'm sorry. Because here's the deal, folks. Whether we realize it or not, people, people that we would encourage to come here and be a part of this church, they're listening to what you're saying. They're hearing the foolishness when you run down the leadership or, or you run down another church member. Does that mean that all our church members are perfect? No. But you know, if you've got a problem with them, the Bible gives a way. It's in Matthew chapter 4, uh, Matthew chapter 18, I'm sorry. A way to deal with if you've got a problem with another brother or sister. Amen? And you know where that begins? It don't begin on your big button phone trying to burn up all your minutes. If you've got a problem, the Bible says, what are you supposed to do? Go to them how? Face to face. You can't work it out. What should happen? Take another brother or sister with you. Is that not right? Still can't work it out. What happens? Go to the church. Exactly right. So there's a way to deal with it. You know what I'm saying? And there's a way that God will honor you dealing with it. But he don't honor this tattletale and big busy body and backbite and all that kind of stuff. And he says, you need to be careful. Amen. One more verse. First Peter 3 and 10. He says, for he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Now, you know, guile can be helpful to the body or it can be a poison. And what he's trying to say is this. He said, if you want to have a good testimony, if you want to have a good relationship with your church and your community, be careful what this thing does. Because that tongue can destroy people's lives. It can destroy ministries. Well, now, I, y'all ever heard this conversation? Well, I heard... Man, that'll get you, Brother John. That's right. That'll be red flags big time, right? Because you heard it, what? Fifth, sixth, twelfth, thirteenth hand? Maybe, if you're lucky. So, a deacon's wife must be not a slamper. Must be sober. <coughs> and must be faithful in all things. Now, of all the qualifications that I see here, that last phrase is the one that scares me as a pastor the most. And that is, and guess what? How many things, ladies, can you not be found faithful in? I'm asking. How many, how many things can you be found not faithful in? Go back to the verse. Verse 11. Faithful in all things. What does faithful mean? Anybody know? True. True. What? I'm sorry. True to your word. Anybody else? Consistent. Consistent. How about this? This is the one I like best. Can be depended upon. 
Can a faithful person be depended upon? Y'all yes. ever, in your secular jobs, uh, you, ever, you ever had those people that were the go-to people? If you had a problem, you know what I'm saying, you could go to that person and you knew something could get done about it? Every one of us should be that person at the face of Baptist Church. Every one of us ought to be so faithful that you know what? When people look at us, they say, you know what? You depend on that person. But you know what we find out more and more? We find out people that will take classes, and guess what? They don't ever show up to class. We find people that want to be a part of events, and then don't show up for the events. Now, is that faithfulness or not? So how do you get there? 1 Corinthians 15 and 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you what? Steadfast, Steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He said, what do you have to do? The first thing is, you have to be grounded. You have to be steadfast. Now, I know people today, guess what? They'll go to any church that has some kind of fad going on, and they'll join that church and be a part of it, hoot and holler with everybody else, and you know what? As soon as they don't have the smoke machine color that they like, guess what will happen? They'll find somewhere else. The first time somebody says, oh, gee, by the way, we missed you. Uh, how about you come be a part of Sunday school? They'll get mad at me. You know why that is? Because they're not grounded. Because if they were grounded and they were steadfast, you know what they would look at when somebody said, gee, by the way, we'd like for you to help with this class or this program? They would be honored that somebody saw faithfulness in them. Galatians 6 and 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, I want you to notice something. What is promised in Galatians? <coughs> what is promised? First and foremost, what's the first thing? Let us not be weary in well-doing. What's promised? That if you do the right thing, what will happen? It's going to wear you out, isn't it? Is that not right? Why is it going to wear you out to do the right thing? Because we live in an evil and perverse world. Is that not right? People want to, I, I can't I remember what movie it was, but the, the guy said, well, I just want you to tell me the truth. And the colonel or general somebody said, you can't handle the truth. Today, people don't want to hear the truth. If you don't believe that, you just take your little idiot box out, the little small one you got on your hip, and flip over there to Facebook. And then, listen to the TV tell you, Facebook might not be telling you the truth. You think? But even though they tell us that, guess what we do? Did you see on Facebook? I'm, I got to check my Facebook. Make sure that I'm there. I got to make this guy richer. He's not rich enough. Think about it for a minute now. Right? You think Facebook wants you to do the right thing? I'll tell you what you do. You put the right thing on there, and I guarantee you, you'll have umpteen gazillion posts that will beat you to death. Oh, tell you you're a narrow-minded, Bible thumper, gun-toting, you're just a bigot. I can't believe that. You know why that is? Because the world don't want to hear the truth. You ever noticed on Facebook? Now, I haven't been on there in a long, long time. Nobody ever posts a picture of themselves when they get up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Their profile page is always a glamour shot. <laughs> And so, really, when you look at their profile page, guess what? You don't know who you're talking to. <laughs> <laughs> After they've been embalmed? Yes, probably so. <laughs> so, the first thing you're promised is that, guess what? If you do the right thing, sometimes it may cost you everything. Y'all remember this morning's sermon? But there's a weariness in that. But he says, don't become weary because he said... There is a season that what will happen. Now this promise is conditional. Because you see the last part of that verse? It starts out with if, 
we what? So there are some people who have been doing the right thing, maybe some of them for a long time. And what happened? They got tired. And when they got tired, what happened? They cheated themselves out of the harvest. God had something way better for them, and guess what they did? They settled for fifth, sixth, seventh best. When God said, you know what? Just stay the course. Just hang on. 1 Peter 1 and 13 says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, does anybody know what he means when he says, gird up your mind? Anybody? Okay, in their day and time, right, when they got ready to run, what, what was the problem? Pants would fall down. They were in what? Robes. Is that not right? So, I don't know if you've ever tried to run in a robe. I've run away from Mary in a robe. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I always got the worst end of the, dip, the, the stick. But, <laughs> so what they would do is they would lash, they, they'd pull a, a, like a belt up between their, the, the robe, and they would tie it off. And what it would do is make it like pants. And they would run, you know what I'm saying? They'd be able to run and battle, and they'd be able to do all those things that they couldn't do without that girded up. And that's what he's saying about your mind. You need to have a protection around your mind. Now, why is that? Anybody? You got a lot of things going on. Yeah. Got a lot of things going on. I better go with that. Everything you hear, everything you see. Scientists tell us that you cannot unsee something. Now think about that for a minute now. You can't not unhear something. Because your mind, your, mind, your brain is so complex that guess what? Everything you see, everything you hear, everything you participate, everything you feel, guess what it does? It stores it somewhere. Now, you may not be able to remember it. You may not be able to recall it, but guess what? That giant computer has put it on that hard drive somewhere. Okay? And so what, and, and it, at the most inopportune time is when it will pop up. And so what he says is, you need to protect your mind. Now what does that mean? Anybody? That means that you cannot go to trash TV and expect for it not to affect you. You can't listen to a bunch of junk and expect it not to affect you. And so he said, be careful because any IT person will tell you, garbage in, garbage out. So if you fill your head with all this stuff that the world is saying, what happens? I'll give you an example. Okay? You'd be surprised at the Christians today who do not believe in creation. They just don't believe it. They've been taught so long that evolution is a fact instead of a theory. From the time they're little, you think about your kids. Let your kid go in the, in the, in the uh, grade school or your grandkid go in there and say, gee, by the way, I believe God created the heavens and the earth. After they get done laughing at them, you're going to get a note or an email that says, we're going to have to send your kid for some psychiatric counseling. Because he believes in fairy tales. I'm serious. I'm serious. Because see, whether you realize or not, evolution is not just a theory. Evolution is a religion. That's what I'm telling you now. Evolution is a religion. Because here's the deal. If you came from a polywog that turned into a frog, that turned into a monkey, that turned into a man, who do you have to be accountable to? The frog? The soup you crawled out of? 
He ain't got nobody to be accountable for. So you mean you know what that means? Whatever I choose to do is all right. But and if and is, since there is a creator God, guess what happens? Now man becomes what? Account. And guess what man don't want to be? Because if I think for a minute that I've got to give an answer for the way I've lived, guess what happens? It makes me much more careful. People say, well, I can't, I, I can't win that God thing for God. I don't know what that is. <clears throat> you know, the Bible tells us it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. And when you get to heaven, I can't find anywhere in the Bible where you're going to be able to stand before the throne of grace and say, oops, I made a mistake. In other words, you get one shot at it. You know what I'm saying? And if you're wrong, for whatever reason, heaven help you. Because you're dealing with your eternity. So, tonight, as you begin to see what these qualifications are. Before you get real quick to jump on the bandwagon and criticize somebody, you might want to look at your own life. You might want to ask God where you're at in your faithfulness, where you're at in your commitment. I wish our church was full of all the people that supposedly are members here so I could ask them the exact same question. Where is your faithfulness? Where is your commitment? We're starting a new year. You know, folks, we started this morning with one of the lowest attendances we've had in a long, long time. And it's a new year. But why is that? Because guess what we find out when we see faithfulness, when we see commitment? We know what it is, but most of us don't practice it. So today, during this invitation, I want you to think about where you're at in the Lord. I want you to think about where you're at in these qualifications. I go you one step further. Look at this and look at your life and see if any of it lines up. If it doesn't, if there are areas where you need to get better, I can think of no better place to start than the first Sunday night in uh, 2018 right here at the altar. Brother David, what number are we going to sing tonight? Yeah, Number 280. Page 280, as you take your hand while you stand with me, turn to page 280 and join me as we pray. Our Father and our God, as we bow in your presence, Lord, we worship you, we honor you, and we praise you. We thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Lord, I thank you for the leadership that we have here at Bethesda. Father, I, I know their hearts, and Lord, I know their lives. I've watched them as you've used them, Lord, over and over and over to minister to this church. Bless them, Lord. Continue to be with their families and help them, Lord, as they minister to us. Lord, help us as a church to always be in prayer for them. For, Lord, we realize that their families are constantly under attack by the evil. Father, for every one of us today, when we're tempted to shoot that arrow, when we're tempted to make that cutting remark, when we're tempted to, to talk about something that's going on inside of the church maybe that we don't agree with, and, and Lord, it, it, it's just, instead of going to that individual and dealing with it, convict us. Father, allow your Holy Spirit to lead us Father, help us today to begin 2018 as one. One working for the grace and the good of the kingdom. God, during this invitation time, Lord, speak to hearts as only you're able to. And Father, we will praise you, we will worship you, and we will honor you. Because we've asked all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. And my family said to them. Imagine wait for the music. God's speaking.